Nobel laureate Wale Shoyinka has predicted that Nigerians would continue to call for restructuring after the new administration assumes office on May 29. Shoyinka stated that the government of President-elect Bola Ahmed Tinubu must renew its focus on the persistent calls for restructuring the Nigerian Federation in order to avoid serious difficulties with its programs and policies. Also, Shoyinka denounced the menacing utterances of the vice presidential candidate of the Labour Party, Dati Baba Ahmed, describing it as unbecoming. He further stated that the Nigerian presidency should go to the southeast region in order to heal from the wounds of the civil war. Joining us now on the show to air his views on the state of the nation of Nigeria and the 2023 governorship and presidential election is Nobel laureate Professor Wale Shoyinka. Good morning, Professor, and welcome to the morning show. Hello, can you hear me, Prof? Yes, yeah, oh. but please speak up a little bit more okay. clearly. Thank you. Well, let's start with uh, your latest statement, which I uh, read yesterday, about media responsibility uh, in a season of civic uncertainty. And the fact that uh, the mutual obligation that you talk about there, the media at this moment in Nigeria is also complaining about repression, about harassment by certain institutions of state and also by uh, certain interested groups, particularly spokespersons of political parties. Let me uh, uh, remind you and um, anybody listening that we've had uh, several cases of uh, the final arbitration in this kind of election uh, being placed in the lap of the courts. We'll go back all the way to the 12, the infamous, or for some people, famous and brilliant uh, 12 two-thirds decision. Uh, uh, during that process, if you go all the way back in history, I never heard anyone from any side threaten the judiciary the way I heard it uh, when uh, Mr. Dati was speaking on television when I came. Uh, and since then, since that uh, decision, we've also had uh, even the decision of the court which brought Buhari into power after the decision was given after he had already been sworn in. And again, while awaiting that decision, I never heard the kind of language, the kind of menacing, blackmailing language as that which was... Uh, uh, to which we were treated by Mr. Dati. And that kind of attitude and that kind of, uh, uh, that kind of go, do or die kind of uh, provocation is not what I think we've, been, we've all been struggling for. Let me, by the way, take a break. I, I seem to be on the right line because you haven't interrupted me. As I said, I didn't hear your question properly. Let me introduce myself properly. I happen to be the person who told uh, uh, one of the candidates, former vice president, Atiku, when he was contesting and he came to see me in my office in Ikeja some years ago. He came with Benga Daniel, my former governor of August State. I said to him, listen, it's about time you people left the stage. Why don't you just go away? We need an infusion of fresh blood into the system. But some people, maybe they read it as a bloodletting. No, I said infusion of fresh blood. I said, so I cannot support you. I think your generation should really quit. Right, he wasn't the only one. I then sought out uh, the current president-elect, uh, Ahmed Tinubu, and I gave him exactly the same message. I said, whatever you people are planning, I'm convinced that we need a young generation, new thinking, new sensibilities, new energies. So why don't you just leave this thing? Let's look for somebody, a really brilliant individual, and then you use your entire, your influence to catapult that person to power. And this country will see a massive transformation. We spoke for about an hour and a half. In the end, Bola Tinubu said, no. He said, uh, 
there were still things which I felt you could contribute. You know, I have not, Balaji Tinubu and myself have not met. That's over, getting to five years ago, we've not met once since. Simultaneously, we called uh, willing and enthusiastic and brilliant young people together and we said, look, come together, give us a candidate. We'll back that candidate with all our resources. We need somebody else at the, at the helm of affairs. And so, for me, the emergence of the uh, Peter B movement is the consequence of events like that, including, as I've stated, the NSARS movement. And all this was done in a democratic spirit. Persuasion, campaigning, mobilizing, sometimes even tutoring prospective candidates. Whether or not my position at the time towards Atiku or Tinumbu was correct or not, that's not important. All I'm trying to tell you is to say that we acted out of conviction and therefore we have absolutely no reason to appear even uh, to be against any new generational possibility, potential, uh, in, 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 when in time for election comes. I have been distressed, however, by this uh, certain aspects of this movement, which for me tended towards the fascistic. And we haven't come this way, this, all this distance, made all this sacrifice, to watch the entire procedure being jeopardized permanently with unpredictable consequences if we get to a situation where threatening, menacing language is being used, where people are beginning to be afraid to talk, to advise, to contribute, simply because there's, a, there's disagreement over tactics. And so this is what I was objecting to in, uh, in uh, Dati's performance. Uh, you can't say, give me this uh, mandate. There's also a third person there, as a Tiku, for instance. And in any case, the procedure is such that no one can say that we have seen terminus as yet. That's all. That's what I was, I was criticizing. And I was very distressed to see this being reported as if saying, swear this person in. Don't swear this person in. No, 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 no. That is a total distortion. And uh, public discourse, I believe, is jeopardized when that kind of misinterpretation is made of something which I have said. All right, Professor Sherinka, thank you very much for joining us. I just want to ask you, you have said that the statement made by uh, Dati Ahmed is unbecoming. And what some people might want to ask you is, what part of his statement did you find unbecoming? Was it the entirety of his statement or the fact that he had mentioned, and I quote, because a few things you had said, people feel that it was quite strong, bearing in mind that other actors in this political process have said perhaps even worse things. So it would be good for you to tell us what part of his statement you found on becoming of a vice presidential candidate. And then the second aspect of this, since you've taken us back to uh, pre-election and you speaking to the principle of front, front runners in the, in the election process, is your assessment of the election process and the emergence of the president-elect? Again, I must apologize to you and your uh, audience if uh, I didn't catch your question correctly. I lost about two thirds of it. But I think I got the drift of what you were saying. And again, let me introduce myself further. I happen to be again that individual who, uh, after an election which was massively rigged, who sat in the plane waiting for the final result, the authenticated results to be brought to me. I was on my way to the United States to address the congr uh, a congressional hearing of the Nigerian elections on those particular elections. And I said to them, uh, the uh, Oshimali people, I said, I will do nothing if I do not have the right documentation, the latest authenticated in every respect, which I can present to the congressional hearing. 
it was brought to me from Edo State. It was brought to me while I was seated in the plane before the gates closed. With those documents, I was able to go confidently to Washington, where I met in Amani, by the way, and we joined forces to reverse the thinking of congressional hearing, which was already sold on the false results of the election throughout. The propaganda of the government then in power, I refuse to mention names, was so strong that when we got there, we found a hostile reception. However, armed with those documents, we reversed the thinking of the congressional hearing. Now, this is the kind of person I am. I do my homework thoroughly. I don't like being stampeded. I don't like people making claims which they have not thoroughly investigated and unleashed on the, on the populace. And so when all these claims are going on, uh, uh, please remember, I was away during those elections, but as soon as I came back, having been bombarded right, left and center by so many comments, links being sent to me, I then pursued my inquiry. And my statement when I did that interview was this, that it's not yet time. The last word has not been spoken on these elections. So do not threaten people and further alienate even those who were on your side from the beginning. That's the message. So when I use the example of Donald Trump, look at him now, a common felon, who not only wanted to disrupt the entire system, to reimpose himself on the people, but went further and stormed the capital, resulting in some deaths, said, don't use language of incitement, which leads to that kind of result. And I don't care who doesn't want to hear it. <laughs> I speak the truth. People want to, they can listen, they may not listen, but there are precedents all over the world from which we can learn. And in this particular case, using the American system, uh, it's normal to use, uh, shall we say, uh, models of events to teach ourselves certain various levels, uh, lessons. And so that's it. You know, when I use, when I summon Donald Trump, it's simply to tell people, you're beginning to behave like Donald Trump. And that's not very good for democracy in this country. That's all. But Prof, the uh, fascism that you observe in the conduct of the uh, Third Force, at least some elements there, were you surprised? Isn't this uh, part of uh, the national character? And can we ever find a cure for Nigerians likely to behave like they are fascists? Sorry, <laughs> most of that I missed completely. Um, so it's very difficult for me to even guess the thrust of your... Okay, uh, I was asking you about fascism. The fascism you criticized in the conduct of certain elements in the emergent third force. Were you surprised, considering the fact that Nigerians tend to behave generally like fascists, whether they are in politics or they are in any other aspect? Can we ever find a cure? or that kind of behavior? Um, any other access? Uh, please understand me. Civil action is always justifiable. In any situation of discontent, civil action is always possible. But then we also must be very guarded in our statement, the nature of civil action. If you say we're in a revolutionary state, and we need a revolution, if you like, a kind of show or a revolution, a revolution now, then I understand your language. Uh, a particular direction has been plotted. But if, if we are not in a revolutionary state, if everyone is still observing the procedural uh, aspects of an election, a democratic election, and we're waiting for results, then for heaven's sake, let us com complete that process. Don't ask another elected person, whether it's a president or INEC or other uh, ombudsman, if we have it, don't ask them 
to act unconstitutionally. And don't, above all, don't threaten. Don't use the language of menace. I also want to use this opportunity, I hope you don't mind, to warn your audience, please beware of fake news. A lot of damage is being done by the uh, propagation of fake news. Even as recently as a few days ago, some garbage, some verbiage, some nauseating, praise singing uh, tract, which we've seen so many times before, has been resurrected and attributed to Wallace Shuinka. It makes me sick, and it makes me just want to opt out. I mean, I do not see why this issue, this problem, cannot be solved. If people want to be praise singers, let them please do it in their own and their father's name and leave Shoinka out of it. In fact, things are rich state. I'm going to go further. You, do, you permit me. I want to use this opportunity now to announce a reward. I'm not a rich man, but I'm going to announce a reward. I, I've looked at my accounts and I can afford a thousand dollars, a thousand dollars to anyone who can finger successfully the author of some of the tracts which have been attributed to me over the past six months, which we have repudiated again, again, and again. Yet comes out. Other people come out, they say, no, no, no. Wally Shane can never said this. But no, there are those who want to believe it and those who think they're having some traction. So there it is. Permit me to use you as my advertising board. A thousand dollars. I will even go further and try and raise additional funds for anyone who can please relieve us of this incubus of false attribution of fake news. I'm sorry if I've diverged from whatever you asked, but I didn't hear most of it. <laughs> in any case, all this is involved in the theme which we're addressing this morning. Absolutely. I'd like to go back to my question because I wanted to ask you in the spirit of debunking fake news, which part of Dati Ahmed's statement did you find unbecoming? Was it the entirety of the statement, of his statement, or a portion of that statement, and which part of it? Yeah. It's all very well going back to your question, but it's still going back to the kind of uh, breaks which we had. The, the transmission is is really problematic. It could be my personal problem of hearing. I don't want to blame the equipment completely, but I think um, uh, we really have a problem. And since you say you had a specific question, this time I don't want to go, on a go off on a tangent unless I can hear it very clearly, distinctly. Okay. Not, All right, um, so I'll repeat the question, and I'll, I'll just, um, if my, the audience would permit for me to pick the word so you can make it out clearly. I asked, going to your previous response, which part or what part of Senator Dati Ahmed's statement was unbecoming? Ah, uh, okay. Nearly the totality. Listen, the interviewer asked him several times. He said, what will you do if the Supreme Court judgment is against you? If the interpretation which you are offering about the constitutional aspect of this election, if it is against that of the Supreme Court and they find against you. And he kept saying, no, it's not even open to analysis. The, the word says, and, and it's very clear. And the Supreme Court, in its wisdom, had better give this, in other words, his interpretation. I mean, this is, this is trying to dictate to the supreme arbiter of the nation. Whatever you think of the Supreme Court, it is an institution we, we all uh, revert to sooner or later. If not today, then tomorrow. If not about this election, maybe about the next election. But that he kept saying, no, the Supreme Court has got in its wisdom to agree with me. That, kind, that is what is known as fascistic language. It is not acceptable. And for me, it alienates people. It alienates even supporters. I know this for a fact. People come to me, you know how I relate to young people. I relate to those 
who have found certain problems with the spokespeople of this particular movement. I'm not interested in the other ones. Everybody knows the other movements. But there's a new boy on the, on the block, as the expression stays. And many of us have been waiting for that new kid on the block. And so we have a stake in it. And wherever it seems to be going wrong, we're going to tell the truth to that new kid and the supporters who also say they have allied thinking with us, that's all. But go and watch that tape all over again. Introduce that tape to any kind of neutral jury, uh, members of whom don't even know anything about the uh, Nigerian situation. Talk about body language, talk about vocal language, talk about the actual text of Dati's pronouncement. This is intimidation and it's not acceptable. I refuse to be part of that kind of language. But Prof, uh, you referred recently to, again, to restructuring. What kind of restructuring would you like to see? What kind of what, sorry? Restructuring of Nigeria would you like to see? Sorry, oh, <laughs> problem again. So I was asking, you rec you've recommended restructuring of Nigeria. What's the word? What comes after that? Restructuring. What kind of restructuring? Instruction? Restructuring. Structure. Structure. Restructuring. Restructure. Ah, yes. What kind of structure? Restructuring. Mm -hmm. Would yeah. you like to see? Of, uh, oh, for, you mean for the nation? Yes. Yes, for the nation. For the nation? I'm talking about decentralization. That's all I want out of the incoming government, any, whichever it is. Let us have a genuine, uh, not rhetorical, but a genuine, pra practical, detailed decentralization. The redevolution of powers, more devolution of powers to the various arms, the various tiers of government, state, local government, the reinforcement of civil uh, entities, civil society, in the various uh, uh, groupings. That is the kind of structure which I want. We you can summarize it in that one word, decentralization, yes. All right, L let's come back to what you said about ethnic profiling in Lagos State and you condemning it. I'd like to get your thoughts on that, especially the, some ethnic-based campaigns in the last election and what's happening in Lagos State currently and other parts of the country, I must say. Oh, in the other election, what's happening? Oh dear, we have a technological so, problem. So I, I was talk looking just ethnic profiling, ethnic bigotry. What part? Ethnic, uh, ethnic bigotry. Sorry. So I, you, you, you've condemned what happened in Lagos State, and I mentioned it also happened in other it's parts. Interesting. Yes. Well, I think what you ask is what happened during the election, uh, and remember, I'm relying both on reports and written um, the newspapers, the media. I'm relying on the links which were sent to me. Something happened during the election, especially the governorship election, which for me was most distasteful and dis distressing. And, yeah, and this was the targeting, I think without question, the targeting of non-states people, especially those who are considered strangers to the community during the governorship elections. If you like, I, I'm trying to avoid the ethnic word because I didn't want to go there. However, if I ask a question, there was a kind of, uh, there, was a, uh, there, there was a real targeting of certain sections of Lagos where the Igbo population was prominent. And I think that was disgraceful and deserved to be condemned by every serious thinking person. I hope that relates to what you asked because all I heard was happening, then I heard election, 
didn't you like or whatever, sorry, best I can do. Okay, Prof, let me ask you about President Muhammadu Buhari. What would be your assessment? If you were to rate him, what would be your score? You want, we're asking about President Buhari, did you say? Yes, sir. President Buhari's performance so far. President Buhari's performance as president. Uh, president Buhari. His performance. Your assessment. Legacy, uh, sustenance. Assessment, right. assessment. Your assessment. I say, oh, my assessment. Yes. Well, <laughs> I don't think we need to even waste much intellectual energy to assess Buhari's uh, tenure because he's living on a very sour note, uh, a note of sadism. I'm referring to the policy which overnight impoverished uh, millions and millions of Nigerians. You know, the currency change, et cetera, et cetera. If he was hoping to go out on a high note, I'm sorry, he will find himself, he has disappointed. That single action has really wiped out the major part of his achievement because to have embarked on a, an action like that and to have attempted, in fact, not, not just attempted, to have moved to disobey the judgment, the decision of the Supreme Court over the currency validity uh, is for me a sour legacy to leave to those who believe in democracy and who believe that the primary duty of any uh, leader, any national leader, is the welfare of the people. So whatever, uh, if he's hoping history will be kind to him, his final act in office I'm afraid, has uh, soured the, uh, the assessment, the positive, possible positive aspect of the overall assessment. And uh, let me use this opportunity, by the way, to go back to my, what I said about decentralization. You saw in what happened, the action, the initiative taken by certain governors, you saw decentralization is action, in action. I'm talking about when governors like El Rufai, Akiri Dolu, Sonwolu in Lagos, and some other governors, I forget which ones now, not only took the government, the central government to court, but told their people, you ignore the center and obey the decision of the Supreme Court. They said, in our state, the old currency remains valid for as long as the Supreme Court pronounces it so. Said, so forget what the center says. Now, that for me is true federalism in action on behalf of the people and respecting the law of the land. It is that kind of transformation which I look forward to seeing in uh, the activities and the political attitude of whichever government comes in power. Anything short of that, we just tread in the same old sports of centralization in new guises. And that means the economic and political and ideological retardation of this nation. Well, thank you very much, Professor Walesho in Canobel Loret for your time this morning on The Morning Show. <laughs>